Uh, so welcome everyone. We're going to talk about intro R today. I see from the poll everyone had no trouble installing. That's great. We're also going to install some packages during the workshop that might cause some errors. Uh, so please like stop us and like we need to get those figured out when they happen because it'll inhibit being able to do the rest of the workshop if your packages uh, aren't installed yet. You should have gotten a, a download as well as the link to all of the materials. They're here on GitHub. And you know when you download them, the file structure looks just like this. And so if you want to, I'll be coding live as well, but if you want to follow along, the notes are like the main thing we're going through. If you don't want to download, fun fact about GitHub, you can just look at the PDF uh, directly online. Um, or if you download it, and my preference personally is the HTML version because you can click around the, uh, the table of contents uh, here. If you got the, if you signed up like early, <laughs> there are some typos <laughs> in the version you have, nothing that'll ruin the code, but just, you know, the one on GitHub does have all the, the, the typos that are not words uh, corrected. So you may want to download them uh, to keep for posterity, I guess, uh, but all the code runs and everything like that. And you'll see if you know this is the this is the page with all of everything we're doing today and Friday, but you can go back in time and also see that this is not our first rodeo. Uh, taught similar things to the lab when I started last summer. We did similar thing for those joining, and so you know if you want additional practice, going through these workshops are the same sort of ideas but with different data can be fun and can be helpful, uh, as well as you know if, if you end up going on into R and think like, oh, I want to learn R Markdown. Well, there's some material here to get you started if you want, or I have to do linear modeling. Here's some things. Uh, and I push these in the sense that I'm available pretty much whenever to answer questions and help with them because I'm the one who taught them. Uh, so you may have, you know, online resources that you really love to use. Use those if that's what you're used to. But if you don't have anything or don't know where to start, this is great because I can answer questions and or point you to, oops, to where. I learned these things myself. Okay. So we're going to get started. Everyone should have R and R Studio installed. Uh, make sure to open R Studio, uh, not R, and then you'll, they look very different. So you should be able to see um, multi panels here. Spaces uh, of this R console here. This is R. This is like base R. If you open just, if you don't install R Studio and open just R, you'll get just this left side, uh, where you know you can like type to the console. Like that's not a command, so it doesn't look like hello. Uh, and we'll be typing in there as well as typing uh, in notes. Mine may look a little different from yours. Uh, I stare at a computer screen many, many, many hours a day, so I like a black background. Uh, but if you don't, or if you want to change to one, uh, under Tools, Global Options, you'll find uh, Appearance, and you can change to your color palette of choice. I love a good neon, so I like chaos um, as well if you are <laughs> blind like me, uh, larger than the, I think, default 10 or 12 font is, is sometimes nice. I'm going to make the font even bigger uh, just so it's even easier to see if this ever gets projected. I find 24 is usually uh, sufficient. So you'll see printed at the top, this is the version of R. Yours may be slightly different. Um, it's really important over time if you keep using R to like to update your R periodically, but don't feel like you have to update every single new version, uh, particularly when this last number changes. It usually means really tiny changes, uh, maybe, you know, bug fixes. So if you're having problems with a bug, sometimes it's worth doing it because it'll fix your problem. Uh, but really, you know, it's when this number changes, there's been a rather substantial or you know huge changes the first number uh, so that yours might not be exactly this number it's actually probably not since this is from last year um, but just if you keep using it keep in mind you know this is actually about old enough that i should probably update <laughs> uh, being about a year and also you'll have your operating system any other information uh, when you're posting if you ever post questions on like Stack Overflow, often it's really uh, helpful to post these first three lines at the start being like, this is the version I'm on, this is my operating system. It really helps those of us who answer questions uh, know whether to think, oh, is this a Mac Windows thing? 
is this an R4402 thing where we know there was a bug fix in R403? Uh, I can really quickly get you an answer when the answer is just you need to update something. So this is the console. Mainly, uh, you could do everything that we're going to do just in the console. You don't need any of the other features of RStudio necessarily, but they're really, really nice. Uh, the first being this upper part here, your environment. When we load in tables and other sorts of data, they're listed here. So you can, you know, see them appear when you do something new, as well as when we have them there, you can click on them to see them. Uh, Cause sometimes, you know, when you're working with a table and you like select one column or delete one column, it's nice to physically look at the table and make sure that happened. Uh, so you're sure. Um, as well as you, history, if you've never worked in R before, yours will be blank, uh, but we see here, I haven't typed anything but hi in this time, but it does go back to these are the last things I did when I opened R, you know, earlier today. So the history is really great and it goes back quite some time. Uh, like you can just keep loading. Uh, so if there's something you typed and you didn't save, but you knew you did it recently, sometimes this is nice to go back and like, oh gosh, what was that? I don't want to rethink about it. What was that package name? What was I doing? Uh, this can be a real lifesaver when you haven't uh, saved it yet. And the other part, we're not really, we're not going to use the connections. I, I don't even know if default you have it. Uh, if you have GitHub installed on your computer, GitHub sometimes shows up here. I have that turned off. Uh, we don't need to worry about any of those. Just history. If you want to see what you've typed in the past and then environment, we'll use more. And then the other part is the file explorer and like plots. So this opens in, that's the wrong one. It should open in my home directory. There we go. Uh, it'll open in just whatever the home directory on your, your computer is. So like users Kim is mine, yours might be documents or my documents or something like that. And you can use it just like a file explorer, just like you would on your computer. Like I can go in and be like, oh, here's, here's a project, here's a thing. Uh, but if you need to open files, you can double click on them, they'll open, but we'll also code how to open them as well. When we make plots, they'll pop up here. When we ask, um, you know, when we look at packages, you can see I have a million installed. <laughs> I'll look here and then help when you, we'll show you how to ask for help within R. This is great because often when you Google a function, th this page online is what shows up as the first response. So you don't actually need the internet, uh, which is great when you're on a plane, you can just ask for help in R uh, and it'll give you like at least the place to start if you know the function name. As well as viewer, if you make a plot or a file that's not just like a simple static, so like the HTML version of the notes, things like that, uh, they show up in viewer instead of plot. We're not going to use that uh, today. So really just plots, you'll see some cool things uh, pop up. So that's the pieces of R. Any questions for anyone who R didn't open? Silence is good. Okay, success. Yes. So uh, what we're going to be working in today is called an R project. Uh, again, similar to R Studio versus R, you're not required to work in projects. You don't have to, but I find it incredibly helpful for organization. Uh, if you go up to your upper right here, you'll see it says project none because you in are not in one yet. And if you open, you see I use projects for literally everything. <laughs> see your past project names. Um, we're going to make a new one for this workshop. So, or no, no, because I actually see I take it back. I've never sent out the full thing. You already have a project. So if you needed to make a new one, you don't have to do this. If you needed to make a new project, you would go here. Or if you already have one, you can open it from here. So this is the project we're working in, but I'm not going to click back because I'm going to show you in my finder as well. So when you downloaded everything, you should have gotten this file. And so when you're working with R projects, don't open the notes, don't open your R scripts, always open it from this R proj file. And it'll open up a new R session for me. Um, you see notes are open, we'll talk about it in a second. And really just up here, you can see you're in a project because it lists the name up there. You can make a new folder when you make this. You can put it in an already made folder. You can do any of that. 
and the reason we like doing this is you can see right off the bat the last time i was working in this project i was editing the typos in the notes uh, so it automatically opened the notes for me so they're really great in the sense that they keep all your files together as well as if you're currently working it saves your place without you having to remember every file you had open as well as if i had loaded any data here into the environment it would have saved that and would be opening that which i will demonstrate uh, when we actually have data so i'm gonna close these because we don't need them uh, what we're going to be working today is just a simple r script so to do that file new file r script as well as a relatively long keyboard shortcut that I never use. And just open an R script just right off the back, save it. Uh, and you'll see, because I'm in a project, it automatically opens me in this project folder instead of in my home directory like users Kim. So it already is ready to go for saving. Oh gosh, what's the date? 21. You can name this whatever you want. Uh, I name all of them live notes because that's what they are. And we can see here in our files, right? There's our there's our live notes. If I didn't have this open, great thing about the file explorer here, I can click from within here. I don't have to go out and click and then open and come back. It's just I can use this really nice to open. And if I needed to open the notes again, I could just click it. everyone's faces from my notes. There we go. So really for all intents and purposes, an R script is a text file. Uh, just with the fact that it ends in .r means that R and RStudio know that it most likely contains R code, which inside of RStudio, it means it will color code things really nice for you. Uh, so like hashtags mean comments. These are things that are just text. They're not code. So you know, I like to always start like, what's the date? And like, what is the purpose of this script? Intro R live notes. Uh, and see they're gray versus if there were code, like print is a function. We see that the code uh, function is in white for my colors and the parentheses are in pink. Um, another really, really fun thing, if you're using our studio, if you go to global options, uh, and, oh gosh, I have to remember where it is, and code, where are rainbow parentheses? It's under display and code. Code, display, thank you. Um, there's this last one, rainbow parentheses, which I love a rainbow, so that's the only motivation I need. But if you click that, what's really great is when you start to have a million parentheses inside of a function, it's easy to figure out, okay, this is the indigo one. It goes with the indigo one. Uh, if you don't have that turned on, they're all just the same color. Um, so it's nice. And you know, like I said, I love our, I love a rainbow. So, and thanks Max for knowing where it is. Cause I've had it turned on since it was a like alpha feature. Cause I was all about it. Um, and so we're going to put everything in here. Uh, this is, you know, and I'll save like, incessantly because I just have like a command S twitch to save all the time. Uh, so these are great because you're going to save everything you can do. And in future, you'll, if you start working in R more frequently, you're going to really notice that the number one place you find help after a certain point is going back to your old scripts and copy pasting from yourself. Uh, so sometimes you go to Stack Overflow and find, you know, things or the internet or you ask help from colleagues, but often it's just past you if you've written it down and saved it in a place you remember, you can just go copy yourself, uh, including this script, hopefully, will be helpful in future. So R itself has a lot of functions. Um, you know, basic, it's R, it's a statistical software. Uh, so things like calculating means and standard deviations and, and basic plotting are all just part of R. Uh, additionally, when you installed it, it installs a lot, I don't remember the number now, a lot of packages just come come with R. Um, but in addition, you can download one of it's probably millions at this point, at least tens of thousands of other packages. And what a package is, is a pre-bundled 
baggage, <laughs> box of code that all works together to usually do a similar task. So we're going to be on Friday working in what's called the tidyverse, which is a bunch of packages for tidying data and working with data. Um, some of the data we're working with came out of a package called LIMA, which is an acronym having to do with microarray analysis. And so if you go to, well, if you have two R's open, uh, where's my internet? So if you go to the internet and you know look up CRAN, not not the mirrors, uh, which is this is where you install R from. You'll see here that there's a packages, uh, and we'll just sort by name. You see these are all just individual. Some of them have hundreds of functions. Some have just a couple of specialty ones uh, that do any any number of things. Uh, additionally, biologists really took to R really well. Um, and so there's Bioconductor, which is another place that has a bunch of packages. Uh, which I always forget where the list is. It doesn't really matter. Uh, more thousands of packages, often directly related to biology things. Uh, so if you have a biological data set, like a very particular kind of data, often going here and searching, like, RNA sequencing, like what sort of packages? Oh, look, these are all packages that have something to do with RNA sequencing. Uh, and so that can be really helpful to get you started with a new data type that you're not familiar with. But you don't have to go online. You don't have to go here to install them. We're just gonna install them directly in R. So take copious notes in this script. Future you will be very thankful a lot of our um, functions are really intuitive. So installing a package is install.packages. Because I'm in R Studio, it auto completes for me. So I can just click on it or click enter. Uh, and if it's spelled right, so like if I had, if I spelled install wrong, all of a sudden it can't do that for me. So it's also a good typo check. If you think, oh, I'm installing packages. I know, I know that's the function name. Why isn't it showing up? It's probably because there's a typo already in the name. And so R and a lot of languages, right, they have their function, that's install packages. And then within the parentheses, we're going to put every parameter, everything that we want it to do. And so we're going to install for our future selves, for our Friday selves, the tidyverse. And if you have a, if you have a regular laptop, um, I say, so not like a kind of souped up one, um, put the number of CPUs as two. If you have a pretty powerful one, uh, up this to four or six, it will go faster. Uh, but if you don't know, then just put two. And this is just saying use two processors on the machine to do this because it'll run much faster. Because Tidyverse itself is actually not a package. It's like six or seven packages. Um, and so it's going to take a minute. <laughs> I'm not going to run this because I already have it installed and I'm going to be doing other things and showing you other things. Uh, so what you want to do is either click run or you can just hit, uh, oh gosh, I don't want to do it on that line. Let me do it on this line. <laughs> so I'm on this line just to demonstrate. Uh, I could click run and it'll run it down in the console or if my cursor's on the line, I can hit command enter for Mac, control enter for a PC. Uh, and you don't have to highlight like, cause I, this is just one line long. I just need to have my cursor. Like I can have my cursor randomly in that word. That's fine. Uh, I don't need to highlight the whole thing. If you just want one line, you just need to be on that line. Versus if I'm on line seven here where there's nothing, if I hit enter, right, nothing happens because there's nothing on that line uh, to run. So you should get this running. And while it's running in the background, we'll talk about some other stuff. Um, I'm going to start another poll because it takes a super variable amount of time for this to install. I'm going to find the poll button. Oh, cancel. New poll. This might be the first time I've ever tried to do two polls. Oh my gosh. And it locked me out. Never mind, not worth it. So when your install has completed, please put in the chat like success or it's done or 
anything. Um, if there's an error and it says, you know, exit zero status or or the word error also put in the chat to say, hey, this didn't work. Uh, I need help. And I'll open my chat. Oh my gosh, people's are already done. People's computers are so much faster than mine was. Um, okay, so this running and I'll wait for everyone's to be done before we do anything that will act absolutely needed to be done. So this is how you install things from CRAN, the Comprehensive R Archive Network, CRAN. Uh, but like I said, there's also Bioconductor. And so if we want to install from there, it's just, do we first have to install the installer, which is always fun. Uh, so first from CRAN, you have to install Bioc Manager. Manager. Um, it's really small. You don't need to put multiple CPUs, but you can. And then once you have that installed, then you can use it to install from the other that manager. And then it's just install, and we're going to install Lima, which is that microarray slash RNA seq analysis package. You'll see here that this this part. So install packages is in, is in base R. It's just, it's not a not its own package, it's just always there. Uh, so if I just type install packages, it already knows what I want. Because BioManager, Bioc Manager is a new package, it's not default. Um, I want to tell it to use the install function inside of Bioc Manager, not whatever its default is. So to do that, you use the double colon and you say the package name, double colon the function name, and that'll specifically tell R, I want to use this function in this package to run that. And, you know, if you are unsure, uh, that's where these, you know, you can go in here and search, like, so if I search Bioc Manager, I can see here, you know, all of its, all of its various, so here's its install function and things like that. So you can look up all the functions in a package. Uh, starting from packages, look up your package and it'll open up help for you. You can also just ask for help directly in R. So if I just ask, please, I would like help on install. We see that it, it opens Bioc Manager. So this tells me that the only function that I have in any of my packages called install is Bioc Manager. Different if I use something like select, it doesn't know what that is. There's no function that it has loaded that is select, so it can't find anything. So if you already are working with the package and you know that it's that package and you know the you know function name, the single question mark will get you there. But if not, you can use double question mark, which basically means search within everything. And we'll see it, it pops up every single package I have installed that has a select function uh, or that says select somewhere in its description. So it's a sometimes helpful thing. Uh, words like select, not that helpful to general. If you have a really specific word that you're looking for and searching through, um, like I see one there, if I said PubMed, like, you know, not a real word, even that I'm gonna get you know, quite a few, but we see this is just like two pages worth, maybe a page and a half worth of things that say PubMed. So that's specific enough that this would actually be helpful. This would lead me to any function that had to do with PubMed, um, but also, also can be helpful. And one, two, three, four, five, six, eight. So everyone's tidyverse installed, that's good. Now everyone should install Bioc Manager and Lima, which those will be much faster, so you don't have to tell me uh, when they're done. So this installs, but it actually doesn't load them. So an interesting thing about R, because there are 
tens of thousands of packages is it's not going to automatically load every package you have installed because that would take forever. Like when you first start out, it doesn't take that long. When you've been using R for a decade, like, and some of these packages that I have are, are very large and contain like example data and the data themselves are large. Uh, it's not going to load all of them at once because this like, you know, this would take forever. So what you have to do every single time you open R and it seems annoying, but the alternative is for R to take three minutes to, you know, forever to open every time is you have to load your, your packages. So once they're installed, you only have to do that once. Honestly, in a script, I usually comment these lines out because you only have to run them once on your machine. So there's no reason they're there in case you know, you start with a new version of R, but in general, if you needed to redo everything in the script, you wouldn't need to do them. So I comment them out like that. And then when you load them, for unknown reasons, in my mind, uh, you use library instead of package. Uh, and again, autocomplete, we see there's actually quite a few tidy packages. There's tidy R, there's tidy graph, there's tidy select. Uh, the verse, like universe, has a lot of those in them. Let me put this near the top of the screen. So to load a package, you use library and then the name of the package name. And if I run that, we see tidyverse is its own, you know, beast in that it actually is loading all of these packages for you. And similarly, you can do it with Lima. And Lima is just a single package, so there's no like messages or anything. And now I have access to everything in those packages. Before, you know, when I asked select, nothing came up. Now, if I ask select, because I've loaded the tidyverse, which contains dplyr, now it can find it. It couldn't find it before because I hadn't, basically until you load the package, R forgets it exists. It's like, I don't, I don't know what that is. <laughs> I can't help you. Uh, once you load it, now you have access to all of it. Um, so at the start of all your scripts, you should really start with loading all the packages you're going to need for that uh, script. Additionally, something where it's just a good idea to do is set a seed. Uh, nothing we're going to be doing requires any sort of like random number generated seed. But in my experience, it's just good to get in this habit every single script you start with set seed, which means that there's ever a process or an algorithm or anything that requires a random number to start, it will use the same random number every time you run the script. So your results won't be changing. Um, you can put your favorite number uh, on on GitHub. The favorites are 666, 1234, and 420. Uh, I honestly uh, have a numpad and so I just do this and slam my hand on the numpad and whatever number comes out, that's my seed. Uh, but if you have a favorite number, go for it. Um, there's also one random GitHub user who like has a billion scripts and whatever their random seed generated is also a really heavily used one just from them. I don't remember what it was though. Uh, it doesn't matter if it's a one, if it's, you know, a, a hundred, like as long as it's a number even if it's like only the number one, it's fine. I just like to put some true randomness by slamming my hand down. And so like I said, this just means everything is reproducible. The point of having the script is that future you can run exactly the same things and get exactly the same results uh, or copy it to a new data set and have it more guaranteed that it's, uh, that it's gonna work. So basic setup, when you start a script, you may need to install things. You may already not. Uh, if you need help, you know, these really, you don't need to save these in your R script, right? Like, not really. Uh, you'd probably just type them in the console, get the help you need, and then move on. Uh, but they're just here for these notes for reference. You always have to load your packages. Even if they've been installed for two years, you still have to every single time load them and then set a seed, just in case. Okay, so like I said before, we're working in our project. Uh, another really great thing is you don't have to worry about file paths anymore. So if you have any experience in command line or not working in a package or sorry, a project in R, you may have had the problem of 
well, your computer is, you know, mine is users, Kim, documents, Han, project three, right? That's not what it is on your computer. And so if I say load a file from users, Kim, yada, yada, I'm the only person that's going to work for. Uh, and even if I go to my other computer, no, it's not going to work because uh, that computer might have a different username or, or what have you. And so a project is really great is because by default, it assumes it's in the project directory. And so for me, you know, wherever you downloaded yours is wherever it is. And for me, mine's in users, Kim, and it's like kind of deep, right? It's documents, GitHub, the workshops inside this workshop. And so it automatically just assumes this is the file path. And then you just have to say things like, okay, it's in data. And that's so much shorter and also will work on anyone's computer who has this project, which is also really great. And so we're going to load our data. So the most common form of data you'll work with in R is just a table, something you can open in Excel or something that you could open in Excel if it wasn't ginormous. Uh, these ones aren't ginormous, but the original ones were quite large. And to do that, we're going to use read table. So that's the function. And remember, if I like needed help, like what is what does read table do? You can ask, okay, read table, and it'll show me here the help page. Oh, I need to give it a file. I can tell it whether header, so whether the first line is column names, not data. What's the separator? So comma versus tab versus space, and like lots of other options. And so for us, for our file, it's inside data. Remember, we're in a project. I don't need to put users, Kim, blah, blah. Uh, and again, great, great autocomplete. I don't, I don't remember the exact file name. So if I hit tab, it's going to show me all of the files in that folder. So I don't have to remember what it was called. I can just click and say, I want to do the CSV. And if you look at the notes, it's going to show you just the final function that works, uh, but we're going to work up to that. So there's going to be a lot of failed tables for a second before we get to that final thing uh, that that works. So if I run this, see it just prints out the table inside of our R console, uh, but we see it's not formatted right. We haven't told it anything. Read table is the most general of read in functions. It assumes literally nothing about your data other than uh, it should be text and numbers. And so we see that it's put everything in one column called V1. It's not separated them. It's just left the commas. Uh, so we need to tell it some things. So we're just going to continue to build on this. So my first row, the header, is actually variable names. So I can tell it that by saying header equals true. Uh, you can use, so you see here, you can use short form of T. You see that it's still yellow, meaning R still knows you mean true as long as it's capital. Lowercase, it does not know. Uh, but I strongly recommend you take the time to type out true because someday you may have a variable that's named T, uh, you know, in statistics, the T test and things like that. So it's good to just type out true, uh, but you will see in other people's code, it's just shortened to T for true or F for false. So now when we run that, again, command or control enter, we see that there's no V1 anymore. It's used, it's made one giant variable name of everything in that row now separated by periods. Um, it does periods instead of the commas because it's trying to be helpful. It's trying to say like, you shouldn't have a comma in your variable name. So I'm gonna assume that periods will work instead. Uh, it's trying to help, but it's still not correct. And that's because we haven't told it the separator, right? Like it could be a tab, it could be a space, it could be a whatever, and it doesn't know. So we're just gonna keep adding on to that. So our separator is a comma. And so now we actually have the data that we we're expecting. Twenty rows, see here, and then like six columns. But the last thing is this is just in the console. I can't do anything with it. I can't ask like what's the mean of the library size. It's not saved anywhere inside of R. And so what you do is you assign this to something. Uh, I'm a big fan of calling everything dat. <laughs> uh, you can 
you can call it whatever you want. Um, and now using this arrow, I'm now saying take everything that you've read in from the file and save it in DAT. And then we see DAT appear. Oh, too fast. We see DAT appear here. And the great thing about the this environment is I can see 20 observations, six columns. I can look. Okay, 20. Hover over this. Hover. Come on. Column six. Great. Uh, if the table aren't isn't you know huge, you can also look at it. So I can click the little down arrow and see these are my variables. Uh, often, and then later we'll see with the full RNA seq data. This is really hard to see, <laughs> but if it's a small table, this can sometimes be helpful to remind you, like, oh, what was my variable name again? Um, or is that in that table or is it in that other table? So we're calling uh, that, and now I'm actually just looked at the notes. Don't call it dat. We're going to, we're going to delete. So if you ever want to delete everything in your environment, there's a little sweeper here. Just delete it. Uh, should called it meta. That's my bad. The next thing we load is that. So this is meta because it's a metadata table. Okay. Any problems with loading the table? So this is just one option, right? So if I ask for help again on read table, ah, if I actually put a question mark, no. No, it's still up, Never mind. You see that uh, a lot of times our documentation will group similar functions. So like we have read table, we have read CSV, CSV2, uh, delim, and so like delim is automatically gonna assume it's tab separated. So this backslash T and CSV or comma separated is gonna assume a comma separated. So we can actually make our lives a lot easier by just using the correct function to start. And so now we don't have to use any of this. Now we just have what we're gonna assign it to We've told it with the function that there's a header and there's a comma because that's what the default is here. See, that's default already what it is versus default for read table is no header and no separator. And you know, if we run that, it just overwrites this. It's still the, it's still the same. So it ends up with the same thing, but with slightly less code and slightly less typing, which is always nice to reduce how much of that you have to do. So you see our history here, right, of slowly adding up. Really, in the end, in your final R script, this would be the only thing that's in there. Uh, and I will also note, like, there's no, like, notes in here. I, after this, will add a lot of what I'm verbally saying. Uh, add in a bunch of comments with the, with the notes in case you need to go back to them. Um, sorry, there's also somebody logging in and out. If the person who's logging in and out wants to like throw in the chat like what the issue is, we might be able to help. Just let us know. Okay, so this is a table, a single table. You could have opened this in Excel, uh, but it's how you get it into R. It's not the only form of data, it's the most common form of data. The other is an R data file. And our data are really great because it can be more than one table, you can, infinity tables technically. Uh, it can be things that aren't just tables. It can be like plots and like more complicated types of data. And our data are automatically compressed. So if you were to take say 10 tables and save them, the amount of disk space that takes, the amount of space on your hard drive is more than if you saved them all into a single R data object. Uh, so it's smaller and you can put a bunch of stuff into one file. So now I would only have to load this one R data, not all 10 CSV with 10 read CSV lines. 
and it's really simple, you just load. Again, it's in data. Again, I don't remember the exact name, so I hit tab. Tells me my R data name. I'm gonna run it. And this is why I shouldn't have called meta dat to begin with. I forgot that this was called dat. Uh, we see we don't have to assign it to anything uh, like meta uh, or like that because because it was originally saved as our data in R, whatever name it was at the time it was saved is the name that it's given here. And so sometimes when you have a really long cleanup of data, like you just have like messy table after tables, uh, you'll have a huge long script that reads in all your raw tables and in the end outputs a single R data with just say dat in it um, or whatever you've named it. And we can see uh, something really helpful to see is what sort of data are they? So class is the class of data. And we can see the reason uh, the reason we had to install a lemma is because these data were created in lemma. And so you need to have lemma installed to be able to read them, even though at, at their heart, they're just tables. So you don't really need lemma, but it's one of those weird caveats. Uh, so it's an e-list, so it's just a list. Um, which we'll talk more about what a list means, but it's many data frames in one. So like if we click the down arrow here, we see all of its variables. But if we click the down arrow here, we see actually, okay, there's multiple data frames in here, right? There's a data frame with a lot of rows and a couple columns, another data frame, and another one again, a lot of rows, a couple columns. And so instead of having to load the three data frames that are inside a DAT, you just load DAT and then you have everything. And again, throw anything in the chat or ask questions or stop me um, if needed. Ah. So the next part we're talking about is data types. Like so this is this is one data type. Uh, and then within, you know, it itself, it's a list, it's an e-list, uh, but within it, there's data frames. And within that, there's different columns that are different sorts of data. And so, you know, when you look at a data type, really we have what I'm gonna call simple and complex, which we're gonna separate. And dat is complex and metadata is just a simple table. And so, you know, that's really meta complex is dat. So inside of, you know, inside of meta, we can ask a lot of things about it, like what are its dimensions? It's just a table, so dim, 20 rows, six columns. We can see that up here in the environment if we want it as well. And we can access those rows and or those columns in actually quite a few different ways. I'm just gonna show a couple because in the end really on Friday when we do the tidyverse, that's gonna be what I recommend as the number one way. Uh, but being familiar with how base R does it with brackets and parentheses and such is, is helpful. So to get a single column, so that's a single variable, um, I think that's what R calls them. So a single variable, you use the dollar sign operator. So meta dollar sign, our studio is being helpful. It's showing me all the possible column names that I could ask for. Um, if I knew, like I know it's gonna start with F, I'll type F, that's only gonna show me things that have F in them. You can pick whatever one you want. In the notes, we have full ID number. And if we hit enter, we see it prints just that column. Now, if we were to ask, so what, you know, what type of data, lowercase, meta is versus what type of data, meta, full ID. So comparing these two, we see that meta is a data frame. Um, importantly in R, a table and a data frame are technically different. Uh, we're going to be working in the tidyverse, which means everything's a, a data frame um, and some errors that I'll demonstrate on Friday are because it's actually a table and it should be a data frame. But 
basically for intro purposes, they're the same thing. There's some things under the hood that are different, but in like even in my day-to-day -day life, it doesn't really affect anything. Uh, so think of, think of them as uh, synonymous for now. And then if we ask what sort of data are in the full ID, it says character. Because while these are numbers, so they're numeric, they also have hyphens, which means they can't, they're just, they can't just be a number. It's not like 20.1. Uh, so it knows that this has to be a word of some type. It's a word, characters, uh, just happens to also have numbers in it. Similarly, right, we can look at any of the data um, types like lib ID, library ID. It's also a character and you can see that here it's you know, letters and numbers and symbols. So basically if anything that has a weird symbol like a hyphen or an underscore or that has letters uh, will get read in by base R as character. So character. And then we also have numbers. So for example, the library size is numeric. It's a number. In your, in your R travels, you may see some other uh, things. Uh, so numeric, we see here, is kind of the most general form. Um, sometimes you'll also see integer, meaning it's whole number. Uh, sometimes you'll also see double, which means double precise, meaning it's a number with potentially a lot of decimal places. Uh, again, that's all under the hood in the end, really knowing whether it's words or numbers is the important thing. The last one uh, that's kind of important that we're not going to see is what's called logical, which is just lists of true and false. Again, all caps, so R knows that they're illogical, uh, and we'll, we'll use these, but they're not actually in our data to start with, so not in our data. So that's what relatively is simple data or simple data uh, in complex. Like I said, DAT is a list of data frames. And so in order to get inside of it, you basically just need to use the dollar sign more. So just as a reminder, what is DAT? It's a list. We have a cat trying to say hello, please, please. Um, if I ask, you know, what is inside of that again it's the dollar sign so that's how i get a single data frame from within it and we can ask so targets what we don't need to know what targets it is yet but we see it's a data frame uh, fun fact this data frame is exactly the same as that data frame so this isn't in the notes but i think it's fun I can ask, are these identical? Oh, of course. Well, they're in a different order, trust me. <laughs> this is why you shouldn't just randomly add things to a workshop without testing them. They're the same. I just think the rows are in a different order. And, uh, you know, for this, there's multiple, right? There's also E, it's also a data frame, all pieces. Uh, just so you can know that there's three parts, there's also genes. It's also a data frame. And so this gets us basically one level in. Uh, you know, meta only has one level. It just has its variables. DAT has data frames that have variables. So if you want to like get in two levels, you just keep using the dollar sign. So inside of targets, lib size is also in there. And now we see numeric. And so this is just pulling out the single column as a vector. And technically, in theory, things could be nested an infinite amount of times. Um, in the data, at least in our lab that we work with, this is usually the limit of it is you have a list of data frames that have columns. Uh, but technically, it could get even more complicated. And not sort of data we have here, but data 
could potentially see, uh, this is technically an S3 object. There are S4 objects that work exactly the same, only you have to use an at symbol instead of a dollar sign to get inside of them. Uh, and I, I very rarely come across those. And to be honest, usually I have to Google like which is which to remember. And that's in the notes, the little note that you just use the at symbol. Chugging right along since there's no questions. So recapping, right? All we've really done is loaded in our data and kind of looked at it. Um, slow but steady. Uh, the next thing we're going to do is actually start doing things to it, asking questions you might not might want to ask of your data. Um, and like I said, R is at its heart a statistical software. Uh, so without needing any additional packages or anything, we can just do like simple statistics on things. Um, so we can, you know, it says operate in the nose, but yeah, run functions on data. Um, that's being simple statistics. Just to be specific. So to do that, you know, this is how we extracted each piece. We asked what the class of it was. Instead, we can throw in any other function. We can ask, you know, what is the mean? The function is mean of, you know, dat, say, targets. What's the mean library size? Run that. You know, it's over 9 million. So very good for our seq data. You can ask, what is the variance? You know, very similarly. You can ask, what's the standard deviation? So, you know, there's an, all of the kind of classic ones are just in here. Standard deviation. Okay. Uh, and, you know, it's again, one of those, if you don't happen to know, like mean is my favorite one, like is it average or is it mean? And if you can't remember, it's, you know, if I were to do average, nothing would come up versus if I did mean, now it's gonna pop up with the help for mean. So the help can also be good to check whether that's actually the function name, because if it's not, it won't find it. Uh, so it's a good check because I think in Excel it's average. <laughs> so it's easy to get those mixed up. So this runs a calculation on them. You can also like ask a question. So like, is what's actually in the notes to be specific is the library size lib size greater than 10 million and we see again that logical thing uh, uh for each row it's telling me okay in this row no it's not larger than 10 million in this row it's true and so you know printing this out often isn't what you want to do, but we can then use this to subset our data, which we'll do next after I show a couple other questions you can ask. Um, so it's just going row by row and saying, when is this true? When is it false? And importantly, you know, this is greater than, this is greater than or equal to. It's the same result for these, uh, but it is important to write remember whether you want to be inclusive of the top or bottom number uh, or not. Actually, so that's the same solution, so I won't. None of them are exactly equal to 10 million. Uh, another helpful thing is if you want to see all possible values. So for numbers, less helpful. But let's say I want to see what are the unique values, targets of my condition. So I, I, I know these data and I know that there's a limited number of potential conditions, but if you didn't know, you could just be exploring your data and look and see, oh, there's either media or TB infected. So that's really helpful for characters. When it's numeric, it's less helpful because it's just gonna print every single unique number, which often is all of them.
So with base functions, uh, it's making an assumption about your data and your, it's up to you to basically give it the right type of data. So like using the correct type of data, which is class of data, same thing. You know, if I were to ask it, let's calculate the mean of tat targets of something that's a character. So like I know lib ID is like letters and numbers. It's going to run, uh, but it's going to give us a warning. So it's going to tell us our answer is NA, which makes sense. The mean of not numbers is not a number. Uh, and then throw this warning of like pretty actually helpful for once with the warning of the it's not numeric or true false. So it's the default is if this isn't a real number, it's NA. And this is important to note of what the difference in R between a warning and an error are. In general, the warning means the function ran, it completed, but the output it's giving you or the input you gave it, something was not expected. So this, like it expected a numeric or logical, it didn't get one. So it still ran, but it gave you an NA because it can't actually calculate the mean, but it still ran. So if I had a script running and I didn't notice this, if I were then doing a calculation on this mean value later on, it would still run. It would just keep being NA until the very end. In contrast, an error means the function didn't run. It means it did not complete. And so, so error versus warning, yeah, that's a warning. But if I were to instead, let's say I, I try to run on data because I typoed um, targets. Let's actually give it something that would technically be numeric. So I have a typo, you know, and I run that now it says error which means it didn't complete. If I tried to run anything on this later on, it would also throw an error and wouldn't complete. Uh, and if you try to like run a script through in like, the, you know, in command line, this is where it fails. Uh, and so it tells you like a less helpful error message of type closure is not susceptible. This is also a good example of some R errors are extremely helpful and tell you exactly the problem. Others are, you know, this is a really common one, so I know what it means, but when I first saw it, I copy pasted and Googled it and was like, what does that mean? Um, uh, but it's, you know, what it's telling you is that data targets, there's, there's no closure, meaning it couldn't find it. It doesn't exist. Uh, and in our case, it's because it's a typo. Before we get into subsetting and a bunch of examples of that, because uh, as you realize two hours is a while and because my water glass is empty, uh, we're going to take a five minute break for bio break, stretch, do what you need to, pause the recording. So five minutes, reconvene at 3.35. And also if anyone just has random R thoughts or questions and wants to chat during the break, I'll just still be here.
resume recording. Okay. So again, all like all we've really done is like explore the data uh, and calculate some simple statistics on it. And now we're going to do some data subsetting, which is like really the meat of I would say like 50% of what I do is just getting the data in the form that you need or the subset of it that you want or whatever uh, have you. And really, I do this all in tidyverse, but to learn these functions that go inside of tidyverse functions, base R is um, really helpful. Oh, not typing. So subsetting data. So we're going to use those true false factors uh, to do our final subsetting, but we can also just pull out a single piece at a time if we want. Uh, so I'm going to switch back to using meta because it's shorter. I'm realizing I'm using the dat targets all the time and meta is the same thing. So I can pull out if I know in meta that I want just the fifth row, all data frames and tables uh, are treated with square brackets, which I'll type this out of ooh, that's a comment of rows, comma, columns. And so I can say, give me, you know, the fifth row, give me the fifth column, which happens to be our SID. You can see, you know, one, two, three, four, five, this, this column. And because it's a data frame, I need those two pieces. I need to put row and column. If I just said meta five, it's going to give me the fifth column by default. And instead of listing everything as a vector, so this is now a vector the values, it's keeping it as a data frame form. Uh, so it runs, but this it's usually good to really specify. And you can specify both, right? You can say, I want the fifth row and the fifth column. And that's the RSID of the fifth row. That's a data frame, right? So a simpler, a vector, so a variable, right? Vector, which in our case is just a variable, which is just a column, lots of names for the same thing. Uh, we don't have two parts. We just have one. A vector has single, just one has length not multiple like a data frame so we can say like get just our vector oops, of our lib ids and then i say i want the fifth one if i tried to you know if i thought this whoops if i thought this was a data frame and i tried to do this it's going to say error because it's an incorrect number of dimensions there isn't rows and columns in this so it can't do it. It gives you an error and it doesn't run. And so, you know, we can move around this data frame, but right in the real world, you don't usually know <laughs> that it's the fifth row. Uh, you know, I never remember the order my columns are in, except that the first one is always libid and after that, who knows? So, you know, you can reorder, right? Like maybe you thought it was row five, but then somebody, you know, reordered here, like maybe reordered by condition and now five is not what you thought five was. And so instead of pulling out exact numbers like this, often it's helpful to ask R a question like what row is RSAD whatever number? What rows have more than a million sequences? And so we can use those true false vectors that it creates to say, give me all of the rows where this is true. And by default, it always uh, asks what's true. You can co-opt it to say what's not true, uh, but honestly, the easiest way to subset data in this way is to craft your statement, your question, so that the answer true is what you want. Crafting it that false is what you want uh, is possible, but then there's just extra steps. And honestly, it's just easier to like reword your question to be true is is the things you want. And so if you remember, uh, we can ask a question, right? So like, we're going to ask, is the condition equal to, oops, on the same line, is equal to media? Uh, in R, double equals is asking if something is equal to, uh, because single, where is, where's a function that actually has it? Single equals are most often used inside of functions to say header is, it's not asking, you're telling it header is equal to true. Here you're asking is condition equal 
for that. So that's where the double equals comes in consistently. And so like if we run this, we get a la you know, a list of true falses. And so we can save this as a logical vector, which is kind of a long name for this, but that's fine. Equals media. So now we're just saving. And we can see oops, let's close that. You can see now, you know, data, it's data frames and lists are up here, values, so simple vectors or like a single number, like if I saved x, uh, you know, equals 2, it also shows up here, simple. So we have our logical vector saved, and now we can subset by that. We can say meta brackets, we're going to subset rows, so we know it goes before the um, comma it's actually it's just really good practices to always if you're going to be working with the data frame with brackets start the brackets put the comma then think about which side it goes on um, it really helps instead of accidentally doing columns when you meant rows uh, but now we're going to put in the logical vector as our rows and so now i'm gonna do that again so it actually prints on one line there we go now we just get all of the rows where this was true. And, you know, we didn't actually have to save this like this, you know, that's extra code, that's extra things in our environment, we could have just simply not saved our logical vector and put it in like that, which gives us the same thing. And, you know, you can do this for anything. So let's ask where library size library size is greater than or equal to 10 million. Now we get all the ones where there's more than 10 million sequences. And we can start adding these together too. Um, we can pull the notes over because it's listed nicely here. These are the kind of the most commonly used operators. So, you know, exactly equal to not equal to. So that's the idea of crafting your statement such that true is what you want. So you can use not, which is the exclamation, greater than, with or without equal to, less than. In is important uh, for if you, if I wanted to select, so let's say I had something that was media, TV, and C. difficile, and I only wanted media and TV, then I would say in media, comma, TV, because I could be either one. Um, which actually I'll just, that's, I shouldn't just say that, I'll actually craft that. So let's say this will be all of the data because we only have media and TV. Oh, actually let's do, let's do RSID because that actually works. So let's say we want just this RSID and this RSID. There's multiple ways we can do that. We can say that we want RSID in, oops, inside a vector, C being a vector, of either this one, just going to copy it, and they have to be inside of quotations because they're characters. So I can say it's in this, so I get the four. I could say meta, where meta RSID exactly equals this. Or the you know or so that's an or operator we haven't talked about but it's down here or and then and is the normal and symbol so we'll say either it's equal to this you know again there's a lot of copy pasting in code you already see or this same exact answer you know this is technically shorter um, so it's preferred but you know, sometimes you'll ask it, I want RSID equal to this or full ID equal to this other thing. And so that's where or can really come in handy. Um, in contrast, if I were to say something like and, so I want both of these things to be true, it's going to give me nothing because there's no row that has two RSIDs. Um, yeah. So that's really, in is great when you have multiple things you're searching and you don't want to list or, 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 or. You list like all of them together. 
Uh, and then you can also look for missing data. So is NA, is it NA? And then you put the thing that you're asking in the parentheses. It's a slightly different function than the, you know, than something like this where you put on the left and right this, you have to put it inside of the parentheses. And then similarly, the exclamation to say not is not missing. And so, you know, nothing in our data is missing. Nothing is an NA. Um, and if you end up running into issues with reading in your data and like your NAs are ND for not detected or they're N slash A for NA, uh, check out the help page for read table or read CSV. It tells you exactly how to tell R what your NA values are. Uh, by default, anything that's blank or a uppercase NA, it will read. And that's the only thing in the cell. If it was like NA2, it would count that as a character. But if it's just NA or it's blank, it knows it's missing. Okay. So now the next part is a very uh, collaborative. Uh, so I'm going to I'm gonna say the intro and then turn off the, the, the recording. But we're going to pair up and work on the exercises and then come back and talk about them. And then it'll also then just be an open discussion of was there anything you were really hoping to see that I could add right then or that we could go over on Friday.